So there was a man who had worked all of his life and had saved all of his money. He was a real miser and selfish when it came to his money. He loved money more than just about anything. And just before he died, he said to his wife, Now listen, when I die, I want you to take all my money and place it in this casket with me because I want to take all my money to the afterlife. So he got his wife to promise him with all her heart that when he died, she would put all the money in the casket with him. Well, well, one day he died. He was stretched out on the casket. The wife was sitting there in the back next to their, next to their uh, best friend. When they finished the ceremony, just before uh, the undertakers got ready to close the casket, the wife said, wait a minute. She had a shoebox with her. She came over with the box and placed it in the casket. Then the undertaker locked, locked the casket and rolled it away. Her friend said, I hope you weren't crazy enough to pull all, put all that money in there with that stingy old man. She said, yes, I promised. I'm a good Christian. I can't lie. I promised him that I was going to put the money in that casket with him. You mean to tell me you put every cent of his money in the casket with him? I sure did, said the wife. I got it all together. I put it into my account, and I wrote him a check. <laughs> you know, ultimately, as we get to selfishness this morning, I figured I'd try and start off with something that is a little funny in terms of just how selfish we can become and what people suffer because of our selfishness. But we have to work through the first part of uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, this is a slide we ended with last week in terms of just Paul encouraging ultimately for us to find the resources that are in Christ for our Christian lives in general and more specifically for the unity that God would call us to. So again, if there's encouragement being united with Christ, if there's comfort from His love, if there's any fellowship with His Spirit, you know, and, and basically looking at all those things last week in terms of are they true? Like, it is true that we are encouraged by being united with God. It is true that we're comforted by His love. But again, how do those things lead to unity? And this last one in terms of having fellowship with the Spirit, again, I cannot encourage you enough uh, to know the power of the Spirit, to welcome Him into your life, to continue to get, engage in faith and word in terms of growing your understanding of that, that aspect of the Christian life that really is, is, it, it assists knowledge, is an additional to the things we would know about God and really knowing God personally because His Spirit is within us. Again, even that aspect of just welcoming that dynamic, believing that dynamic. You know, I believe with, when it comes to the various things of the Christian life, we shouldn't be surprised that faith is the key. <laughs> like like faith, is the th faith is the thing that in the, unlocks the things of God. So when, when I believe that the Spirit is present, well, then all of a sudden I will find the Spirit present and really engaging with all the things the Spirit offers us in our lives. Um, but again, how does that lead to unity? That's what we didn't get to uh, last week. But effectively, if the same Spirit that is in me is in you, duh, <laughs> I mean, doesn't that reinforce unity? I mean, how can He be telling you something different than He's telling me? Uh, both in terms of the personal conflict or misunderstanding or offense that might have, ha, be there personally, as well as the greater truth or knowledge that we would have about the Word or about God or about His provisions for our lives. Like, how would we uh, determine things in life, you know, based in His Word? And again, that, that fellowship with the Spirit, that, that the Spirit is the same, the same Spirit in you is in me, if it is the same Spirit, if you are you know, believing Jesus Christ, if you are in the Word, you have the Holy Spirit. Well, again, He's not divided. He, he doesn't disagree with Himself. And so, therefore, there should be great unity that comes uh, from the fellowship that we have with the Spirit. So, the last thing that Paul says in this first verse, though, is any tenderness and compassion. Again, if there's any tenderness and compassion, like, do you have that? Effectively, you should have that. You should have tenderness, compassion. You should have encouragement from being united with Christ. All these things are true, but are they true of you is, is really what Paul would be saying. So when you think about tenderness and compassion, very similar in terms of their ideas. When I see words like this, I look up, you know, I mean, definitions in terms of how people would think about it. 
And, and again, same kind of ideas come with tenderness and compassion. But to kind of unpack it, uh, tenderness means to be gentle and kind. It is responding softly to someone in need as opposed to harshly expressions of care. And so, so, so when you think about being tender with someone, you know, you, th- you think about a plant that is broken, and you're dealing with that plant in a tender way, whereas you go to an oak tree, and, and they can handle the, your, your, your rough treatment and cutting things off and sawing things down and, you know, to give it life. But, but this little tender, you know, let, let me make sure I pr- pr- protect it and, 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 and care for it in the way that it needs. Like, be, be soft in terms of how I deal with it. You know, same thing with people. Again, do you have tenderness for people? Compassion ultimately means to suffer together. That's what the word leads us to. It is meeting someone where they are and joining them there. You know, I know for us, when we meet people and we see people, you know, maybe that they're hurting or they're, they have issues or problems in relationship and finances, whatever, it's very easy for us to say, this is what you've done wrong and this is how you have to fix it. And you might be loving and helpful when you do that, but that's not really compassionate. Compassionate is meeting people where they are and being with them there, identifying with them as they are there, like caring about it and, and, and being, caring about the situation they're in and caring about them, being affected and concerned by it. Like it's not this distant relationship, but here are the hurting people over there and I'm over here and I'm not really going to get my hands dirty. I'm really not going to engage. You know, something that I do think about in terms of an international news cycle is the fact that we learn about hard things that are happening in situations that we can't do anything about. And that's something that's bad about, oh, this is happening in China, this is happening in India, like these tragic things, like my heart goes out to them, but I can't do anything. What tends to happen is you start thinking about things that are now next door. Like you get so used to seeing tragic things that are happening that you can't do anything about, now something is tragic 20 miles from you, ah, you know, some, someone else will take care of that. I really don't need to be concerned about that. Ugh. That's not compassion. That's not something God would lead us to in terms of, again, how we would be affected by the suffering that other people are going through, identifying with them rather than criticizing or blaming them. Identifying with them rather than criticizing them. I mean, there is a point of instruction like there's a point of truth, there's a, there's a point of encouragement and, and leading people in the way that will ultimately benefit them. But the compassion, that I mean, what compassion means is identifying with that person right where they are. And again, how does that lead to unity? <clears throat> how does that reinforce us being together in terms of relationship, together in terms of work and the, and the things that we would do Well, naturally, if we have compassion for people, if we have tenderness for people, we're not going to easily set people aside. We're not so easily going to create situations that would lead to disunity or division in terms of how we would treat people. And so again, when we're tender and compassionate, see, rather than than asking people to understand where you are, you understand where people are. And part of what causes division is when all you think about is people have to understand me. (laughs) They have to be where I am. (laughs) And, 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 And that's not what, again, that's how tenderness and compassion ultimately reinforces that unity because that is what, that is what Paul is, is, is pressing, particularly in, in, in chapter two. In chapter one, effectively, he talked about being united with Christ. Now in chapter 2, he's talking about being united with each other and starts off with very powerful spiritual dynamics, the things that come from God that that we would then operate in, in the way we conduct ourselves with each other. So again, if you have any encouragement being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship with the Spirit, if if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And so what parents, like in the same way that any parent has joy over their children being in unity, so Paul once again expresses his pastor's heart by how much he he would be gladdened by their unity. 
I mean, don't, don't you see that, uh, parents? You know, when you're looking at your children and they're getting together, you know, one of, one of my favorite things as a dad is seeing my children interact with each other and, and loving each other and caring about each other and laughing together and so on and so forth. Like, I don't, I don't need to be involved. Can I just be an observer of, of the relationships you have with each other? And I think that's what Paul is expressing here in terms of just really what he, like, he wouldn't want, he would not want their activity to be for his sake. So he's not saying, well, can you guys be unified so I can have joy? Like, I don't have much joy, so can you be? But he's just saying, this is how I would respond. <laughs> like, like, this is how I, like, the, the wish that I have for you is what would then bring joy to my heart. And the focus and the, the theme of this letter is joy. So I think Paul is kind of throwing that in, recognizing, you know, just the, the, the part of the dynamic that creates joy in the Christian life. You know, when, when you see people that you're trying to teach and disciple and grow, and they're getting it, they're growing, they're expressing the aspects that God would call them to, that brings joy, like that's part of the joy of the Christian life. It's not just what God is doing with you and in how you're being built up, but how other people are being up, built up. So again, when you're growing in Christ and you're now influencing other people and now they're doing what they're supposed to do, that's part of the joy that you receive in playing the role that God would have all of us in as disciplers, as people that are trying to build up the Christian life in other people. And so that's what Paul, Paul is saying here. But what, if, what does this unity look like to Paul? How would he define it? I and mean, what does unity look like? Again, it's being like-minded. <clears throat> when you think about what that means in terms of what Paul is calling us to, it's thinking the same way, believing the same truth, having the same standards, the same reference point. You know, when, when you think about unity in the Christian life, unity in the Christian life is not uniformity. See, it's not something that comes from the outside where people just look the same, like they think the same way, they talk the same way, almost in a robotic way of, again, this is the... But, but when you think about the mind of Christ, when you think about all the things that are true about the Scriptures, and what would that would then ca cause us to think, cause us to realize, cause us to live in, cause to be guided by... Do you see how that makes us like-minded? You know, I think I've said this before, but I think you also recognize it too. When you're out and about in the world and you come across someone that you don't even know, have never met before, but then you realize they're a Christian, then all of a sudden you start talking to them. It's like, hey, you know something? There's, there's affinity here. There's commonality here. There's like-mindedness here in terms of the way you think about things, the way you process things, and that's what Paul is saying. Like, live in that. That, that, that is a great expression. Like, what would you call unity? Is Again, when we are like-minded. But it's not, it's, 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 you know, it's agreeing to disagree sometimes. It's not about, you know, being cookie cutters like we all have short hair and we all wear the suits and we... It's not that, but it's a like-mindedness in terms of what God fosters ultimately. You know, and that is why it is important you know, for us all to be in the Word, to make sure that the Word is not something, you know, the Bible is not a book on the table, but it's something that's written on our hearts. So that will be true of us. You know, one thing that I do say for people is if you're looking for friends, you're looking for good relationships, the best place to do that is in church. Because basically what you have is you're all going to the same place as a reference point for, for standards. You all have a, a right to call people out or, or, or recognize something that has done wrong or, or how we would define certain things in terms of the way we would act or how we would behave. You know, how, what we would reference for forgiveness, what we would reference in terms of kindness and understanding. It, it's all the same. And so, so, so that's a great benefit that comes from the church, but you know, what, what reflects that unity is us being like-minded because we have the mind of Christ, we're thinking like Jesus thinks, we're thinking ways that are supported by this book, and, and so therefore that, that, is, that is what that unity is, you know, the, or an expression of that unity, what, what unity looks like to Paul, again, like-minded, 
And then secondly, having the same love. What, I mean, what a powerful statement that is in terms of having the same love, namely unconditional love. Like when you think about our, the source of our love, where does love come from? It comes from God. We love because God first loved us. Love is not about who you are or what you offer me. Love is not about, you know, you, you have money, you have certain talents, or, you know, I can, I can be in a relationship with you and I can gain something from you. You know, you, you do this thing, you fix cars, or you're a lawyer, or, you know, again, you, you do the thing that I'm going to be in a relationship with you for what I can get. That is not Christian love. That is not unconditional love. That is not the love that God fosters in our heart because it is a love that values people regardless of who they are. Like if you find yourself engaging with people differently because of their status, that's a bad sign. If you are dismissing people because of their status, that's a bad sign. If you're dismissing people because of their race, because of their gender, whatever it would be, anything that is of the flesh, anything that would, you know, that, that, is, that is part of their physical being, if you will, even their, even their behavioral uh, aspect, and, and, and you not loving them because of that. Oh, well, they do this. They ride a motorcycle. I don't love them. They've got tattoos. I, that is not the love of God. And, and, and yet, when we come together as believers and have that same love, I do believe that one thing that should define the church is that we cross barriers that other people don't cross. We, we, we engage in relationship with people that when the world thinks of it, they don't engage in relationship that way. They don't love in the same way. They don't value people in the same way. You know, when I say here... Uh, namely, unconditional love, that love that has the same source, it's all coming from God, the same values. What I mean by that is that we value people because God values them. We don't value people because they're valuable to us. We value them because God values them. And so therefore, we find a value, we find a way to express that love because of their unconditional value to God. And you know, having the same selfless motive. Again, my relationship with you is not about me. It's about you. It's about God. It's about what he is fostering in that relationship, not, not what is happening on a human level. The same purity, the same idea of like, what is going on in this relationship? What, what am I engaging with you for? What am I thinking in my mind? I mean, when you think about that, half of the population is a different gender. And there are certain things that we associate with that different gender that has no place in the relationship we have with that gender. You get what I'm saying? Can I say that in soft, <laughs> in non-sexual terms? And like the, like the point being, if we bring sexual thoughts into a place where it has no place, again, you don't have the same love. We're not, we're not speaking the same language. We're not thinking the same thing. And how important it is when we're engaging in relationship with people where that we know it's just not an issue. I think that is part of the freedom that comes in male and female relationships in Christianity because we're not, we're not going there. We're not thinking that. We're not checking you out. We're not thinking about, oh, this is this and that is that, and I think this, and you're hot and you're not. <laughs> like, we're, we're not thinking those things. So, so part of having the same love in our world is having the same purity, having the same understanding of what thoughts do I have as I'm engaging with you, and I'm not going there in my mind. Again, having the same love, the same forgiveness and understanding the fact that we realize in our relationships, we are going to blow it. We are going to do something wrong. I promise, boy, if you have been here for 25 years and I've never offended you, God bless you. <laughs> you know, because like, I am, I'm going to say things that are wrong. I'm going to say things that are callous. And by the way, you are too. <laughs> 
you know, you're, you're going to say things to me too and, and each other. So like, but the same love says, I forgive you. Like love covers a multitude of sins or if it doesn't cover the multitude, I, I, I come and I confront you. Again, we, we, we know the same basis of, of what, how relationships function and that's a beautiful thing. And, and, and again, that, that's, that's the expression of that unity. Like we have the same love. It has the same force, the same source. It has the same value in terms of what I'm thinking. Same, same purity, the same forgiveness, the same understanding, the compassion that I would have towards people. Again, that's what unity looks like to Paul. Like-minded, having the same love, and then lastly, being one in spirit and purpose. I mean, when you look at that, um, you'll go to the next, the next slide. The, the, the actual word is being joined in soul is, is what is in, the, is in the Greek. Like there is a connectedness. There is an affinity with each other and, and for each other. Again, that connectedness that comes from God. Going back to that example that I said about, you know, you meet a believer and you don't know them, and you have to start having a conversation, and there's just an affinity, because the Spirit in you is speaking to the Spirit in them, and the Spirit in them is speaking to the Spirit in you, and affirming that relationship. Again, that's what unity looks like in the... See, again, it's not a, uni see, see, it's not a uniformity that the world can understand. See, if, if, if we come and say, okay, we're together because, okay, we're all rich, or we're all white, or we're all black, or we're all this. And that's how we, like, you, you, you are defined in this church because of this thing, or your obedience to this standard, or whatever it would be. You know, I, I would say if I do anything, if we do anything at Living Hope Christian Church that creates cliques, that creates classes, that boy, these are the special people because they do this. Oh, those people that come to Bible study. Oh, you want to be the pastor's favorite? Come to Bible study. You know, you want to have, go do that, do it. No, what, what connects us is, 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 like in terms of your value, in terms of your, my engagement with you, hey, you know, there's, there, we join together. Now, would it be nice if you were a Bible study? Would it be nice if you were, yeah, I'd like that. My, my joy would be complete if you came to Bible study. But it's not, it's not it, it doesn't define the unity that we have. It doesn't define the, the connectedness that we have together. And then just trying to accomplish the same thing. You know, again, what does unity look like to Paul? Like, how do we know that we're getting there? On one level, what he says in the first verse is this is what fuels it. This is the basis of it. This is what makes, makes it possible. Then in verse 2 is this is what it looks like. And so therefore, on some level, is how are we doing? How are you doing in terms of all the things that are coming from verse 1? And then how are we reflecting that in our activity, in our interaction, in our behavior with one another? Are we being like-minded? Our, do we have the same love? Do we have the same spirit and purpose? Like, do we understand that what we're trying to do is worship God, build up believers, and share the gospel? Now, how we do that, what that looks like, that is, see, there is the expression of the difference that is in the congregation. Like, the goal is the same, the purpose is the same, what we're accomplishing is the same, but now how we do that is the difference of the expression of the different talents and gifts that come. You know, I talked about, I talked about this float that, you know, it's, for me, you say there's going to be a parade in town and I can be part of it, I'm going to be part of it. I, I, I hope you agree with that. I hope you get as excited as I do, to think that there is something going in a parade that is representing Jesus, that's representing God, that's representing the gospel, maybe on some level representing the church, because that's okay too, but mainly promoting the good news of Jesus. I get excited. See, I, 
Can we silence the feet? No. I get excited when the world welcomes me to come into a place and be like Jesus. We should look, we should look for opportunities when the world welcomes. Hey, you can come volunteer. Really? Well, let me go volunteer there. You know, and then look for the ways that I can minister Christ. So, so, so therefore, we, we, we need creative people. We need mechanical people. We, I, boy, like... Could you imagine mechanical things? Like, I don't know what you would make in terms of things that turns. Or the, we, like, I want Macy's. If, if, if we can get Macy's, I want Macy's. Real, like, look at, and if we can't, it's not a problem. I won't be disappointed. My joy will still be complete, like as long as it, t- it points to Jesus. But boy, if we really could put something together, you know, not, not crazy money, but crazy creativity, crazy expression of all the giftedness of the people here. I would love for that to be the case. Now, where it gets messy is when we now come in a creative way and we're expressing opinion and we have difference of opinion. And that's where the whole dynamic of, wait a minute, we we need to be (laughs) like-minded. We need to have the same love. We have to have the same spirit and purpose. Um, and, And I would even say another thing that the church offers is there also is a basis of authority that is agreed upon. Like there's a basis of saying, okay, first of all, this is the primary authority, you know, the word in, in God. God is the ultimate authority expressed in his word. But then to understand that I and the elders, as, as we are called to negotiate through relationships, called to, you know, resolve conflict in various matters of the church, for everyone to agree, okay, we're going to do what he says because we agree that he's the pastor. We're going to do what he says because he's the committee or team leader or, what, or she or she, he or she is the team leader. Um, and and so, so we have to remember the unity that we should have in the process of doing some creative. But really, I mean, it's October. We're, we're not behind the eight ball. But boy, oh boy, you're like, if, if you're revved up, just tell me, just, Pastor, I'm revved up. Not now. Like, call me, email. I don't care about your gifts. I don't care about your... If you just, I would rather have revved up people that are not as creative or not as mechanical, but I'm just revved up. If you're revved up, give me a call, email me, whatever. Tell Kelly, I, I'm revved up. And we, I would just love to sit down with the people that are revved up. And then, and then we'll get the fix-it people and the build-it people and the, yeah. So, so, but, but that's all the same spirit and purpose. Again, we're trying, like I am always working that. I am always thinking, how do we make the gospel of Jesus obvious and compelling? Obvious, it's right out there, it's in your face, you can't get away from it. Now, loving as I'm doing that, but you can't get, and it's compelling. Like, this is good stuff. You know, part of our mission statement is, again, bringing people from the mediocrity of the world to the magnificence of Christ. The people in the world think they have something, and they don't. Satan is deceiving them, thinking they have something, but to the glory of Jesus, it's mediocre. I mean, it's also wrong, but it's mediocre in terms of all that God intends for us as human beings. And so that, that, that's why I'm always thinking... I'm always thinking in that direction. You, you ever have ideas in that direction? Again, I, I might be revved up for your idea. Um, but but, but uh, again, so having, that's what Paul, when, when we think about what, the power of unity in verse 1, the influence of unity in verse 1, the, the, the um, expressions of unity in verse 2, and, I, and I, hope we're, I hope we're getting there. I hope we're remembering things as we um, engage with each other. Verse 3 and 4 are really, are really powerful in terms of just how it confronts us in our lives. And we're not going to get, we're not going to be able to, oh yeah. Uh, there's always another point. Like, why do I have other points? No, so, so the, point, the point being is that, you know, you think about, oh, be encouraged by the unity you have in Christ, you know, you know receiving the same love from God, having tenderness, compassion, you know, all those things, those are the po- being like-minded, you know, uh, having the same love, you know, being united in spirit, and per- that's all positive things. You know, we just have to re- recognize that if we're going to be unified, we have to think about the negative things we avoid, the jealousy, 
the gossip, the anger, the, the backbiting, the pride, you know, all the, all the negative things that come in and corrupt that stuff. But Paul, Paul mentions two of them, and that's the point of why he goes and says what he says in verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. I mean, don't miss the nothing. Do nothing. You know, whenever the Bible says always, nothing, don't miss, do nothing, nothing out of vain conceit or selfish ambition. It is not about you. If there's anything the world needs to learn, if there's anything we need to learn as believers, and how challenging it becomes in a world that is so focused on self that it's not about you. Selfish ambition, you know, has to do with our progress, the things we accomplish, making things about your status, your success, your prospering, independent of how it affects others. That's selfish ambition. And the next phrase that I have is a pretty good, good one. As long as I get ahead, nothing else matters. That's selfish ambition. Hopefully that's, that's not you. And any part of you that is that, watch it, watch it, change it. Again, you don't have a black spot on you. Oh, there's the bad guy. Set him in the corner. No, let's learn. Let's grow. Let's, let's confront that and purify it in terms of what God would desire in terms of those good, those unselfish ambitions, those godly goals. Vain can see like selfish ambitions about progress, accomplishment. Vain can see it's about me, like what I think about myself. You know, how does it make me look? Am I more regarded and recognized? Again, do nothing out of these things, nothing out of what, again, is going to move you forward, make you, you know, more wealthy or more comfortable or, you know, more popular. Do, do, do not, like, that is not the point. That, that, like, once you make that the point, you, you corrupt your soul and you're, and you're blocked from all the things that God would welcome you in and free you to by virtue of coming under His Spirit, His Word, to be the person you're supposed to be. I mean, we'll, we'll unpack, uh, the, you know, in terms of the humility stuff. And whew. So humility, to do nothing out of humility. Let, 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 let's just, I mean, we'll probably have to do a little bit more with this, but I want to start getting to the list that I have about indications that you might be selfish. Um, so humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's an important thing to understand. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking about yourself less. There is subtle, there's a subtleness of selfishness, pride, and self-centeredness that is in insecurity. I'm an insecure person, so therefore people don't like me. When I walk in the room, this is what people are thinking about me. What are you still thinking? You're still thinking about you. The point is, don't think about yourself. Um, what do I have there? You're not, the, you're not the focal point nor the reference point. Like the best place to get in terms of our understanding of what we are as a human being, like you are not the point. God is the point. The reference point is His truth. So therefore, I'm not doing what I'm doing, getting what I'm getting, pursuing what I'm pursuing because of me, but because God gives me permission for it, or God gives me direction for it. And when your life is more about others than yourself, the wonder, the blessing that comes from that as we participate in God's economy is awesome. You know, the idea of what I... What I get and what you get comes from each other. I mean, that's a beautiful thing in a marriage relationship particularly, that again, the wife gets what she needs from her husband, and her husband gets what he needs from the wife. Children and parents, they, so, so it's not, I press my needs, I want what I want, look at me, notice me, recognize me. No, <laughs> Like, like you, you should not be promoting yourself. You should be promoting other people. But then when it's that other person's job to promote you, that's a wonderful thing. And, that, and that's the dynamic that God encourages because what ends up happening is we become affirmed in terms of who we are. We become affirmed about who we are as God's creation, bearing the image of God, affirmed in terms of who we are in Christ, and what we are in the context of the Spirit and the Word, but it's not about us. It's about God. 
And again, that is that humility and confidence that comes together. Humility is not insecurity, but recognize you're not the source of anything and you're not better in value than anyone else. You are not the source of anything. Like you, you think, oh, well, but, but I'm better. I'm a better singer. Yeah, you might be, but you're not the source. of. Boy, I'm really a smart, smart person. Pe- people are really, it's really good for, them to, for me to be around, to tell them all the things I know and, and enlighten them to all the things I know. You may be. You may be smarter than, uh, like, don't, don't think that about yourself. Um, like, don't encourage that. Th- but the, the point being is, like, the thing that brings humility in the context is you're not the source of it. So therefore, it's really not to your credit that I can be what I am. I can express the giftedness. I mean, how I compare to other people doesn't matter anyways, and we'll, but we'll get to that. Um, but what brings humility, even the contest of great giftedness and great talent, is I'm not the source of it, that I am what I am by, the virt- by virtue of who God has made me. And again, I'm not more valuable. I'm not better. Like, I, don't know, I don't compare myself to other people. Other people don't matter in that way. Other people don't matter in the way that I compare myself to people. People matter in terms of how I affect them. You know, boy, I, 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 I said that thing, that person seemed to look kind of, uh, what was that? Well, let me go to the person. I, like, I care about how I affected you. I didn't want to dismiss you, offend you, hurt you. What, you know, so if I did that, that's what I care about. But I don't care about like, oh, well, you showed yourself better than me. And you, 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 you sounded smarter at the meeting. And I've got to make sure that I'm the smartest one at the meeting. No. Because, it, it's, because again, when the focal point is God, when the reference point is the word, again, now we're all on the same page. And what, what, what is motivating and what, uh, what again, that, 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 those are the things we think about humility. And the thing about humility is one thing you have, one thing, one, once you think you have it, you just lost it. That, that's, just, you know, but, but, like, so humility is a strange dynamic that I believe that we just seek to gain by virtue of being in the Word, being in the Spirit, and just letting those things flow through. Watching out for pride, watching out for that selfishness, watching out for the ways that, again, I do promote myself. I do think, I do care about what people think of me. Um, <clears throat> And as opposed to, I'm, I'm going I'm to grip my teeth and I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be humble today. You know, because then once you do it, now you're not humble anymore. Oh, well, I'm going to be humble today and I succeeded. Yeah, now, now you're not humble. And so humble is just kind of this, this fruit that it, I, I actually, when I was thinking about these thoughts and in, in reference, I, I had this, why is that not part of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, a lot of those things require humility, but maybe because it's something we have to bring to the table. God, God is not, he'll, he'll foster that, but he's not going to bear that in you. You have to choose, we have to choose to be humble and just to give you a taste of where we're going from here, actually, I'll oh, consider you, yeah, okay. Um, so, so what he says is, do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. That word consider, it's, it's a mindset. It's reflected in action. It implies a conscious, sure judgment resting on carefully weighed facts. That's what that word, consider yourself humble. It's because you've thought about it, You've recognizing that dynamic of what comes from the word, what God declares and what he says, and boy, this is what, this is what I do. And so where we're going from here, and maybe we'll just do one, two. Is that, is, is that clock accurate? Did someone move that clock for... Some ways to consider if you are selfish. One, if you think everyone should be paying attention to you. If you walk into the room and I'm here and everyone should notice, that's a bad sign. Now, I would say for all of these, and there's quite a few, um, for all of these, I can't tell you you're selfish, but for you to tell you yourself you're focused, like if you're doing something with a plan to be noticed, 
Like, boy, I am going to try to do something that makes, makes people pay attention to me. I'm going to sing the loudest, or I'm going to, you know, uh, you know wear some, a certain thing, or I'm going to have the big hat, or I'm going to look better than she does. I'm going to get my hair done, and so I look. You know, you lay, well, yeah, I wouldn't go out the ladies. Because men, do, men do it too, in terms of, again, you're like, yeah, but anything that you would en- engender attention to yourself. Again, if you're doing that, you might be selfish. Now, just because you do things, though, doesn't mean it's necessarily selfish. Like when, I, when I'm back there and I, you, you know, if you hear amens or hallelujahs and it's coming, that's not Kelly. <laughs> that, that, that's me. And, and what I'm doing is trying to encourage, this is not, look, oh, look at me, I, I know the places to say amen or I say it the loudest. Or, it's to encourage us to do stuff like that. Like when you're in a place in worship and you want to cry out to God, cry out to God. If there's something that is fostered in a word, say it out loud. But, but you know, you know, you know how in certain contexts, those amens become about the person. I said 20 amens today, you only say 10. I said, said it louder than you, then... Right? I mean, you know that in churches where that becomes now the competition. You know, yeah, no, they, 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 I won't get it. We're, we're late, and I don't want to end with that thought like that. So, but, so, so, but we'll, we'll end, like, I, again, I have a lot of things like that. And so, so you can choose whether or not you come next week. Because any, any dynamic of selfishness inside you, I will flush out. God will flush out in terms of uh, next Sunday. Did I say Monday or? Uh, so anyways, let, let, so, so that, if that's an indication of where we're going, that, that it's, it's those kind of statements for us to consider. Because again, when it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition of fame, conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. It's right for us to look at the things in our hearts that are selfish. That, that we fight against in terms of, no, I don't want to be thinking that way. I don't want to go in that direction. But let's bow and let's pray. And so, Father, when we think about the life that you call us to in the context of your glory, your power, your spirit, your influence, uh, Father, there's a part of ourselves that we just need to die. We, we, we just need to become less and you become more. And, and, and it doesn't work outside of that. That, that seems like a, a negative thing to our flesh, but boy, I, I challenge and welcome anyone to, to have that dynamic, whether you're 15 or 50 or 70 or 80, grasping hold of that dynamic of what I think about myself so I can think about God differently and welcome Him. Open up the heavens, Lord, and, and, and fill us Because we choose to be humble, we choose to die to ourselves so that you can live and what shines through us is you. Father, I pray that 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 would be what we're all seeking, what we're all desiring. And the unity that comes from that, it'll, it'll, it'll knock our socks off. It'll knock the world's socks off in terms of the glory of Jesus that will be expressed through us. I pray for that, for this congregation. And so we lift this all before you in the matchless name of your son, Jesus. Amen.